The uh, next business is the election of Speaker. Do I have a nomination for the position of Speaker? The Honourable Member for La Trobe. Mr Clerk, it is with great pleasure that I propose to the House for its Speaker, the Honourable Member for Casey, Mr Halverson, and I move that Mr Halverson do take the chair of this House as its Speaker. Yeah. Is the motion seconded? Yes, Mr. The Honourable Clark. Member for Lyon. It gives me great pleasure to second the motion moved by the member for La Trobe that the member for Casey uh, be the Speaker of this House. Does well, the Honourable Member for Casey accept nomination? <laughs> <laughs> Mr Clark, I accept the nomination. <laughs> Is there any further proposal? There being no further proposal, I, the time for proposals has expired, and I declare <laughs> that the honourable member proposed, Mr. Halverson, has been elected as speaker. I wish to express my grateful thanks for the high honour the House has been pleased to confer upon me. Mr uh, Speaker, um, it is uh, with very considerable pleasure uh, that uh, on behalf of the government and in my first remarks uh, to this new parliament as Prime Minister of Australia, uh, that, uh, that I extend to you um, the congratulations of the government parties on your election. You have been a very distinguished and effective member of the House of Representatives since your election to the seat of Casey in 1984. I have known and observed your work um, in the government parties uh, in our earlier manifestation in opposition. You bring a background in the armed services of Australia. You bring to the job of Speaker uh, a considerable affection and regard for the institution of Parliament. And I would like to um, take this opportunity in congratulating you to uh, reaffirm a number of the things uh, that I have said about the importance of reasserting the supremacy of the parliament over the executive, and I say that very deliberately. It is part of our system of government that the executive is uh, controlled by parliament and uh, parliament controlled by the law and the customs and conventions of our society. And uh, I think it is important that steps are made on both sides of the parliament to uh, reassert and re-establish a degree of uh, respect and regard for the institution. Uh, let me say that, uh, for my part, that without in any way abandoning uh, the, uh, the proper role uh, of robust debate and uh, the natural and legitimate right of any government to advocate with passion its own political cause, let me say that this is a parliament comprised of a government and an opposition. Uh, there is a role in the national parliament for uh, proper and full expressions of view from both sides of politics, and I will, to the best of my ability, extend proper courtesies to the leader of the opposition and uh, to all members of the opposition and to the independent members who are greater in number uh, on this occasion than in any of the parliaments that I have uh, sat in since my election in 1974. 
And I can say to you, Mr Speaker, that uh, you will have uh, from me uh, and from the members of the government uh, cooperation and support. I would like, as I said during the election campaign and previously, I would like to have uh, a far more independent role for the Speaker, and that's not meant uh, to reflect adversely on people who've gone before you in that role. I simply want to say that I would like the Speaker to be as independent as possible. I know that you have already announced some steps that uh, you propose to take to give some substance to that, but the real substance of whether or not we have an independent Speaker in this place depends upon how the Speaker behaves and how we behave and how we behave towards each other. And, uh, Putting aside the formality of it, the substance of independence by you will be asserted by how you uh, conduct yourself, uh, how you dispense uh, fairly and equitably the standing orders of the parliament. And if they stand in need of change uh, over time, then the government is willing in proper consultation with the opposition to consider that. I think you will be already aware that the government proposes to sponsor a change to the standing orders to allow a more free-flowing reporting of what goes on in this chamber by television and radio networks and, in fact, to uh, resurrect uh, some proposals that were adopted by one of your predecessors only to be summarily uh, jettisoned uh, by the government of the day. And uh, we will have great pleasure in, uh, in reasserting those because we thought your predecessor was right and uh, on that particular issue and the former government was wrong. Uh, uh, but, um, uh, I thought you're absolutely right, Stephen. You really were. So, uh, so, Mr. Speaker, the other thing that we intend to do, of course, is to uh, return question time to two o'clock in the House of Representatives. And uh, I should confirm to the Parliament, as I have to the people of Australia, that I will be in attendance, uh, uh, barring unforeseen circumstances, at every question time when the Parliament sits. Uh, so, uh, to you, sir, um, it is with a, a genuine uh, degree of warmth that I congratulate you. Um, I know that you will bring enormous uh, commitment and personal dedication uh, to the job of Speaker. You respect the Parliament, you respect the office to which you have been elected, you understand its history, you understand its traditions, you understand the need for it to be filled uh, with a degree of uh, fairness and propriety to both sides, respecting that at the end of the day uh, it is important if we are to have an increased national esteem for the political process in this country that both sides of the House and you and the three of us together uh, do our level best to, to bring that about. So congratulations. I wish you a long and meritorious and uninterrupted service um, uh, for uh, several parliaments into the future um, uh, in uh, your newly uh, chosen and newly elected role. Yeah. Yeah. Leader of the Opposition. Can I join the Prime Minister in his uh, congratulations to you, Mr Speaker, on your elevation? We on this side of the House view your elevation with pleasure. We've known you for a considerable period of time now. We've always found you a person who deals straight with people, and uh, we have every anticipation that you will continue to do that. You stand there in the Westminster system, or you sit there in the Westminster system in, a, uh, uh, in this parliament in an office of uh, very high importance. Uh, I think those of us who love and know the parliamentary tradition all go back to Speaker Lenthal and his confrontation with the Crown uh, when he informed their agents that he had neither eyes to see nor ears to hear nor mouth to speak except that the House directed him. Of course, that was a stand of, of courage uh, which uh, speakers have attempted to emulate ever since. You sit there in Speaker Lenthal's tradition and uh, as a result of that, uh, as well as of your own personal attributes, uh, uh, we uh, of course respect you and uh, look forward to uh, your conduct of the chair over the next parliament. We also understand that you are here something of, uh, in something of, uh, uh, of a living symbol of uh, some elements of the Prime Minister's humour. It, um, it didn't strike us as immediately likely that uh, when the Prime Minister, during the course of the election campaign, uh, announced an intention to support an independent speaker, that we would in fact find the chief whip of the coalition of the parties <laughs> sitting in that place. It was, uh, we thought that perhaps the Prime Minister might have had something else in mind when uh, he discussed an independent speaker in that, uh, that mode. I, 
I, I see a new interpretation of that has emerged from the Prime Minister here, and that uh, relates not so much to the symbols of the office, uh, but how you might ultimately decide to conduct yourself. I think the public out there might have been looking forward to the appointment either of one of the independents uh, here or perhaps something altogether different and an altogether different uh, tradition being established, perhaps something along the lines of the British House of Commons. We on this side of the House uh, have no particular objection to the Prime Minister not appearing to decide to proceed down that line. Uh, basically because we have always been quite satisfied with the system that uh, uh, produces the speakers and, uh, and therefore, and therefore, there, therefore we're quite cheerful to find the Prime Minister emulating our past practices. We, we, don't, find that, uh, we don't find that a difficult thing to uh, live with at all. We, we suspect he might find it somewhat difficult to live with, but we don't. We don't find it difficult to live with. And I, and I note with joy the uh, Prime Minister's assertion of the superiority of the parliament over the executive and look forward to manifestations of that as this proceeds. Manifestations, for example, of uh, decisions to refer before implementation in this chamber or debate in this chamber changes to the standing order to the procedures committee. Generally speaking, we chose when we were changing standing orders to refer those through, to refer those through the procedures committee. So we will, we, will be, we will be providing an opportunity for a gesture uh, tomorrow when these standing orders get placed, a gesture from the parliament as to whether or not there is going to be an assertion of the parliament over the executive by a reference of those standing order changes to the procedures committee, whether or not, of course, parliament subsequently uh, decides to accept the recommendations of the procedures committee is another matter. We also know that you're a manifestation of the sense of humour of the prime minister in another area. You are going to be one of the few members of the Liberal Party actually voted on to achieve a position of high office. We understand indeed that parliamentary committees here, or the chairmanship of parliamentary committees, are not going to be the subject of a vote from the Liberal Party, but appointment by the Prime Minister. The Privileges Committee and, uh, and all the other parliamentary committees associated with it. This is, an interesting, uh, this is, this is a, an interesting thing from two points of view. Firstly, uh, uh, there might be a question mark in the mind of the public out there whether or not this is yet another manifestation of the Prime Minister's sense of humour when it comes to uh, conveying a view that there is a, a superior position in the parliament in, as far as the uh, relationship to the executive is concerned. And I think the other, sense of, the other aspect of the Prime Minister's position on this we would fully comprehend. I mean, if I took a look at the Liberal Party over there, would you want them voting for you in the best of circumstances? Answer no. You couldn't trust them with a vote. But they've trusted you with a vote on this occasion. And, uh, I, and it's a good thing that uh, you have emerged from it, even though I understand there was some reluctance on your part. Again, within the tradition of uh, Speaker Lenthal and others at the time, who had to be put in the chair at sword point, <laughs> you attempted to place there your former superior as Minister for Defence, and uh, I, do, uh, I do praise you for that noteworthy allegiance to your former commanding officer. And, um, and I note that, that uh, in that regard you failed, but you at least did your duty. <laughs> and uh, as an indication of your willingness to do your duty in this chamber, it was a very good sign to the rest of us. I just want you to know that uh, as far as an interpretation of standing orders goes, we will completely settle for the interpretation of standing orders that we heard you so frequently give as Chief Whip for the Opposition. <laughs> we thought there was an interpretation there on standing orders that, uh, that we found on questions of relevance and the like. Quite delightful. And I note that in the comments that you have thus far made in public that, uh, that you have an intention to follow those down the line, as well as being a strict disciplinarian, and, uh, and we can live with that too. So our congratulations go to you. We understand too that uh, you're going to wear robes but not a wig. Uh, you're one of the members of this chamber who uh, can delight in the fact that a wig is not necessary. <laughs> and uh, either either physically or symbolically in your regard. So that halfway house to, uh, to the common touch and the speaker, uh, we're prepared to go along with as well. And uh, I, I end where I began. Uh, I thought that uh, uh, we, we have had some knowledge of you as, uh, in your dealings with us over the years. You're an excellent choice for speaker. You're an honourable, decent, 
human being, a man of, uh, of great direction, and uh, uh, we think that uh, you will grace the chair. Deputy Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, this is a historic moment at the start of the 38th Parliament and one which I think should be honoured properly with uh, your elevation to the chair. I must say uh, I recognise your military service has been outstanding over the years for the Royal Australian Air Force. You were commissioned in 1957, a squadron leader in 1966, a wing commander in 1974 and a group captain in 1979. There's few of us now in the parliament, uh, ex-service men or women or return service men or women, but it's a particular delight to me that you come from the junior service, the Royal Australian Air Force, uh, but that you are well equipped from that experience firsthand in those demanding roles of squadron leader, wing commander and group captain to now act as Speaker of this House of Representatives, Speaker of the Parliament of Australia. I congratulate you I congratulate you on behalf of the Parliamentary National Party. It is then a pity, as we set out on a new parliament, that uh, the Leader of the Opposition strayed, and I won't propose to... to uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, won't propose, I won't propose to respond because it's a historic occasion and one that deserves uh, the honour. Other than to point out that you, sir, have decided to withdraw from the party meeting of which you are a member as part of taking up the role of Speaker, I commend you on that decision. It is a decision not taken lightly, and it is one which uh, I think stands you well as you take up the honourable responsibility of being Speaker of the House of Representatives. And I have every confidence in you, Mr Speaker, in carrying out those duties with a fair application of the standing orders, and one which uh, will be, uh, in fact, uh, involve a two-way uh, cooperative uh, contract with the members and I accept, and I'm sure, that at this, on this first day of the parliament, members will set out with the right intentions, I hope, to cooperate with you to help you in the discharge of those very difficult and challenging duties. We wish you well, extend uh, our greetings to your family on this occasion as well, and we know that you will, uh, in fact, uh, enjoy the confidence of the House, as the Prime Minister said, I hope, for many years to come. Yeah. The right honourable member for New England. Mr Speaker, I'd like to rise and also compliment you and congratulate you on your elevation to the high post you now occupy. I think that uh, all of us recognise that in the makings of any parliament so much depends on the character and nature of debate. Those of us who are in the old place rather regret that at times the nature of debate in the eight years in which we've been in this chamber has not been uh, perhaps as extensive or uh, to the degree that it requires reflection of the points of view of all people of Australia as embrace it as it should be. I know you will encourage that. I wish you well in your post. I thank those members of your party who saw fit to allow my name uh, to be a candidate for the position. I have every confidence in your ability to fill your post with great distinction. And my compliments to your family and yourself and the office you now occupy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Member of Industrial Relations. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, uh, I rise to uh, also add my congratulations to you on your election to the office of uh, Speaker. You had a distinguished career in service of our country prior to entering the parliament, and you have had a very active uh, uh, career in the parliament to date, uh, in committees, uh, in the work of our party, and uh, perhaps on a lighter touch, uh, uh, if they were here today, I think they would join uh, in uh, the uh, words of support from the Leader of uh, the Opposition that uh, Russ Gorman and Lloyd O'Neill uh, you used to often meet in a certain room past the old dining room in the old house, the one with the, the big tables with the green felt. <laughs> and uh, uh, you've been uh, very active in so many aspects of the Parliament in accordance with, of course, the Prime Minister's uh, uh, expressions of support and an indication of the Government's view about the handling of uh, the Parliament. I also am keen to work uh, within the standing orders to see a lift in the parliamentary standards. I must say, uh, Mr Speaker, by way of passing comment, I was uh, interested in the remarks of the Leader of the Opposition in regards to the implementation of committee reports and uh, putting uh, proposals to parliamentary committees, in particular the Parliamentary Committee on Procedures for consideration prior to implementation. In fact, the matters about which we have given notice of motion have in fact been to the Procedures Committee, 
were recommended by the committee and, of course, not approved and taken up by the previous government. Uh, uh, for, for example, uh, for example, the uh, return to previous general practice of presenting second reading speeches is just one of the many matters uh, about which uh, we will implement a committee's recommendation, uh, the uh, allotting of specific time for grievance debate being another. So, Mr Speaker, we look forward to joining a debate in a robust way but within the confines of the standing orders and that we hope the Leader of the Opposition's memory uh, can be extended back beyond the 2nd of March. <laughs> Member for Cunningham. No problems with that. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, may I join with my colleagues in offering my personal congratulations to your elevation of this very high position. I have been taken by comments made by people in this place about uh, the role which you will play, the way in which members of this House will respect the position of Speaker, and I can't help but reflect back upon those same comments being made in many of your predecessors' case. I would simply say to us all in this place, having had some experience of this, that uh, your job, of course, is made a lot easier by the way in which we as members of this place conduct ourselves. From our part, I think it is fair to say that uh, it is a new era. There is no doubt about that. And uh, your role, I think, can in fact be made easier by the way in which members themselves regard this institution of parliament. I, uh, I also noted with some interest some comments that have been made about issues such as independence, impartiality, fairness, new terms, I might say, to some of us in this place. And I always remember, Mr Speaker, that many of the people on the other side now pointing their finger at me seem to get a reasonable deal, particularly the member for Gippsland, always. And I've got all the notes that he used to send me saying, thank you for giving questions to the National Party. The Liberals want them all. I'm sure his colleagues, Mr Speaker, didn't know about that. But I've kept them all, Peter. I'm not sure if I'm ever going to publish a book and have them included, but nevertheless, I've still got them. <laughs> Mr Speaker, I can give you and would like to offer you one or two words of advice in a very serious vein. The first is that your responsibility goes well beyond just the maintenance of control in this chamber, as you will well find out. Your responsibility goes to being either individually or severally with the President of the Senate responsible for the welfare of every person that works within this building. You have four departments of state to run, and in difficult economic times and in government policy terms, that's going to be a real challenge for you to administer. But in that role, you have departmental heads which will give you absolute and superb and loyal service. I can go no further than to suggest to you that at any time, that the clerk of the House of Representatives chooses to give you advice, if you stray from that, you do so at your peril. <laughs> In terms of people that can keep you on the straight and narrow, there are none better than these three sitting here in terms of control of this place, in terms of administration of the parliament and what this institution means. And uh, I know that they will be not only willing but I know that they're straining at the bit to get to you and give you some of that advice. There are others, of course, that will be more than prepared to do so, whether it's by good fortune, good luck or mismanagement, but I've been sat just there. <laughs> now, whilst I said behavioural standards in this place depend on us all, nevertheless there's nothing like an ex-speaker sitting close by to whisper advice occasionally to you. <laughs> It will, be, it will be unbiased, it will be fair, it will be impartial, it will be <laughs> and 304A and 303 are not necessarily interested in hearing from you, I must say. Some of these people in this place don't know what that is, but I'm sure some of them will get to know it. Let me conclude by again saying to you, from my perspective, uh, this position of speaker that you have now been elected to could not have gone to a better choice from the other side of the parliament, indeed, within this whole house. I think you are an honourable person. 
I have had the opportunity to work closely with you in this place since 1984. I have had the opportunity to uh, talk with you at length on issues which have been of concern to me in my former life as the Speaker, and I know that we share the same sorts of values about the importance of the parliament and this parliamentary institution. I wish you success. I am available at any time for consultation. Um, and whether you choose to take that up or not, I hope that you do. There are some things I'm sure that I can tell you about this place that I'm sure the clerk doesn't even want me to tell you about, but I will. And uh, we look forward to your stewardship in this place over the coming term of this parliament as being effective, as being fair, as being unbiased, as being impartial, as being as independent as your colleagues on that side of the parliament would want it to be. Congratulations. I look forward to working with you. Thank you. Member for Latrobe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise with great delight to congratulate you on your election to high office. And I, I think I speak for all of us on this side of the House when I say that it was with, with great delight yesterday that we had the opportunity to select the Speaker, because we now sit on the right side of the House. And it's been a long time in opposition, and, and we will enjoy that. But I also want to speak for I think the people of my electorate and the people of the nation. It was one thing that was apparent to me in this most recent election campaign, and that was that the people have said, look, this huge antagonism in the House of Representatives needs to come to an end, that we would like to respect our members of parliament. We would like them to represent the values that we hold dear. And we don't see that now, and we're giving you, the then opposition, an opportunity to, to run the show with honesty and integrity. And I, I think it behooves all of us to remember the message that the people of Australia are looking to us to act as their leaders, uh, not as a bunch of squabbling schoolchildren. And I am sure that with your background in the military and uh, that, that you will see to it that we behave more reasonably than we have in the most recent past. I was, thinking, I was thinking about what your experience as a stockbroker would bring to this place, and it occurred to me, with this huge backbench on the government side of the House, uh, that your ability to count so that, so that honourable members know that they have an equal share and chance uh, in asking questions and getting up in adjournment debate and grievance debate will be well appreciated. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we all congratulate you. We are confident that your honesty and your integrity and your impartiality will show through in the way this chamber now operates. Member for Lyon. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I too would like to join with previous speakers and uh, the Prime Minister in uh, congratulating you on your election to this high office and uh, the task uh, and wish you all the best for the task that lay in front. And like the previous speaker, the member for La Trobe, I think that you would be well aware of the wishes of the Australian people, which I think were clearly expressed at the last election with regard to the conduct of this chamber. And, uh, you are now the custodian of the standing orders and the steward of, of this House of Representatives chamber, the clearinghouse of uh, political debate in Australia. And, uh, you have a, an awesome responsibility, but I think that uh, your background and the, your history in service for this nation, which dates back to 1957 all the way through to your uh, present uh, position that you have been elected to today, will stand you in good stead to to, uh, to guide the debate in this chamber and also to um, return the confidence that the uh, people of Australia have placed in this parliament and their wishes to see the, the level of debate and their respect for their representatives and the operation of this parliament increase on what it has been in the past. And so, uh, Mr Speaker, to you and your, uh, your wife and your family, congratulations on your election to this high office. It is a, a very, very important position and it's an awesome task in front of you and wish you all the best. Member for more. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I join with uh, colleagues in the House to congratulate you on your election to the honoured position of Speaker of the House. And as a former party colleague of yours, and having served for some time in the Whip's office, uh, I've grown to respect your capacity for hard work and your uh, honourable approach to your duties, particularly when you served as the Chief Opposition Whip. Now, Mr. Speaker, I've spoken to you in recent times to ascertain your approach to the functions of the Office of Speaker, in particular on your views on the question of the independence of the role of Speaker. and I've read your comments or heard your comments since your election uh, in the media, as the, um, or certainly since your uh, 
election as a coalition nominee for the position, and obviously in the chamber today um, listened with interest to the Prime Minister's comments. And although the position that uh, the Prime Minister and you have signalled for your work is a distinct improvement, there is still somewhat of a gap between what was indicated and what was promised, or what has been indicated, I should say, today, and what was promised by the Prime Minister during the recent uh, federal election campaign. Mr Speaker, as an independent member of this House, my rights as a member to represent my constituents will depend very heavily on your application to the independent role of Speaker. It's absolutely clear in my mind that the vast majority of the Australian population expect a great improvement in the way in which we all conduct ourselves and the way in which this chamber conducts itself. Likewise, there is an expectation following the election of the new government that the perceived and real shortcomings will be dealt with in the spirit of the Prime Minister's statements before and during the federal election. Well, Mr Speaker, finally, can I just say that you are only too aware, as the Prime Minister has indicated, that in this chamber is the largest group, minus one at the moment, of elected independent members since the Parliament of 1929. And in fact, if you took out the independent members who were identified as either independent nationalists or West, members of the Western Australian Party, I believe this would actually be the largest group of elected independents since Federation. Um, I might add that in the uh, records there's no official reports of for party affiliation of members by the Department of the House of Representatives until 1956, so there may well be some inaccuracies in some of the earlier records. But I might just point out, Mr Speaker, that we, uh, the independent members, will be making a submission to you in relation to the administrative processes uh, relating to the, proce the procedures of the House, and in particular uh, the administrative arrangements um, for, our, uh, for the independent members that were applicable in the previous parliament, which were administered by then the then op chief opposition whip, which was yourself. And that submission will um, move to have um, our members here recognised for the purposes of administration only as a group or an alliance of non-aligned members. Now, Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker, may I say, Mr. Speaker, may I say that um, Order. I, I, listen, I listen with interest to the interjections of the member for Watson, and um, of course, I make no reflection on uh, on uh, his. Uh, his role as the chief opposition whip, other than the fact that, quite clearly, as independent members, it is probably contrary, contrary to our uh, interest to represent our constituents in an independent way to have our administration or the in, in, our interests administered by the chief opposition whip. And as a consequence, we will be approaching you or to, um, uh, to have what would be an unprecedented new arrangement which would allow for our interests, our speaking rights, our rights, for instance, to ask questions uh, of ministers during question time, our rights in relation to membership of committees, the most important function of the role of uh, members of parliament, um, would be, of course, included in that submission. Now, I was going to say, the, uh, the member for Watson interjects yet again. I might add to him, uh, uh, Mr Speaker, that um, that particular aspect of the arrangements is completely of no interest. I might say that um, we are all interested in this case, the five elected members, in ensuring that we are in a position to properly represent our, our constituents as independent members and the ability for us to be able to speak in this chamber with our rightful position in the speaking lists so that we can do that function um, to the best of our ability. I thank the honourable member for more for his comments. I look forward to receiving your submission in due course, deliberating on it and making the appropriate decisions. Honourable members, I am greatly honoured and deeply touched by the kind expressions of congratulations and goodwill that have been expressed, and I trust that I will prove worthy of the confidence that has been placed upon me. To do so, I will need your cooperation. We would do well to remember that we are here all of us as the servants, not the masters, of this House and the people of Australia. We have an obligation to represent them with dignity and with due regard for the institution which is the cornerstone 
of our democracy. It is our collective responsibility to ensure that this parliament is relevant and meaningful to the citizens of this nation and that we carry out our duties in a manner which is a reflection of our concern for and consideration of their needs and aspirations and is deserving of their respect. Benjamin Disraeli expressed it well. All power is a trust. We are accountable for its exercise. From the people and for the people, all springs and all must exist. I want to assure you, I want to assure you all that I will be taking up the challenge of the Prime Minister's call for an independent speaker. For my part, I will be striving at all times to exercise my role and obligations as Speaker in an objective, constructive and impartial manner. And I earnestly and sincerely seek and will expect your assistance in this endeavour. I thank the House. Uh, Mr Speaker, I have ascertained that it will be His Excellency the Governor-General's pleasure to receive you, Mr Speaker, in the Members' Hall immediately after the resumption of sittings, which I understand will be at 2.30 p.m. Prior to my presentation to His Excellency this afternoon, the bells will ring for five minutes so that honourable members may attend in the chamber and accompany me to the Members' Hall, when they may, if they so wish, be introduced to His Excellency. The sitting is suspended until 2.30 p.m. this afternoon. <laughs>